Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. We're incredibly excited to have you all here. Um, as you file in, let me make sure the room is open. It is. Um, as you file in, tell us your name. Uh, tell us where you're located. Uh, we will have people in the chat uh, communicating with you um, today. And while you chat in, I'm going to give us sort of a quick run through of what to expect in our time together, um, some housekeeping. I'll introduce our panelists. Um, and then we'll get started. Um, so first thing to note is that we are recording this webinar. Uh, the recording will be sent out to everyone uh, that is registered. Um, that'll come in about 24 hours. With that recording, you'll get a copy of the slide deck that we have today, um, a certificate of attendance. Um, we may also reference a variety of resources today. All of the links and the downloadables for those um, will be made available to you um, in the follow-up email that you get um, tomorrow. The next thing to note is there is a chat box available to you in your Zoom window. Take a moment to find it on the screen. And again, let us know who you are, where you're coming from. Um, we are an interactions company, so we want to interact with you. Send in those comments. Um, as we uh, are speaking with you today, you'll also have the option to send in specific questions that you may want answered by the panelist. You can use the Q&A function uh, for that also in your Zoom window. So the Q&A function for questions, uh, the chat just for general comments. We might hold some questions for the end. Uh, we do have a section just for questions, um, but we will do our best to address as many of them as we can um, by the end of the webinar today. Um, all right, with that, I'd like to quickly introduce uh, today's panelists, and then we'll get started. First of all, uh, Aaron Sabina uh, is here today. If many of you have uh, been watching Teach Young webinars, she's a regular face. Um, she is a class consultant uh, for Teach Young. And also joining us today is Kiana Dubashi. Uh, Kiana is the executive director for Profound Ladies. If you're unfamiliar with that organization, they are dedicated to the recruitment and the retention of women of color in education. And luckily for us, Kiana is also the DEI program manager here at Teachstone. Um, welcome and thank you to both of you. Uh, Aaron, I believe you will get us started. Gloria, do you mind sharing your screen? I haven't been sharing my screen this whole time. No, so ma'am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Oh my gosh, you missed all the beautiful faces and the, I am so sorry, everyone. Here are our panelists. <laughs> and Erin is going to get us started. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Gloria. Um, so welcome, everyone. Excited to be here with you all today. So our agenda for today, we're going to begin by talking through parallel process of using class foundations and principles to really create that culture. Discuss the foundations of what makes a strong work culture in schools and in childcare programs. And then we're going to end with sharing some action items for you to be able to build a more supportive and equitable work environment. Uh, so I want to start with a quick, um, just you can put us in the chat if you have an other role. We've got a poll here. We just want to have an idea of who's joining us today. Uh, so are you a teacher or a caregiver? Are you an instructional leader, a site leader, implementation leader, data collector or observer, researcher? So if you can go ahead and fill out the poll here, and then if your answer is other, you can put that in the chat. Take a moment for the poll here. We've got about 30% so far. A lot of instructional coaches and mentors and program leaders. All right, so I'm gonna, there we go. All right. So Gloria, we can go to the next slide here, I think. Uh, so we're going to discuss using class as a culture building framework. So, you know, here at TeachStone, we live class, we breathe class. 
Uh, the importance of interactions goes beyond just the teacher-child interactions. It's really how you interact with everyone. So creating that really great culture based on what we know about great interactions from class. Now more than ever, um, administrators, leaders, and folks like yourself should be thinking a lot about what it will take to retain teachers, um, given that there are so many other factors pulling folks away from the industry. Um, there are alarming polls that share that there will be this mass exodus of teachers, given all that they are facing um, with both the global health pandemic and also some of the social unrest that continues to plague our country. And so um, we are excited that you all are invested in your um, culture and are thinking a lot about the folks who are leading in learning environments every day. I'm muted. So I'm gonna start off talking about servant leadership here. Uh, so servant leadership is generally a business principle, uh, but I think it can really be applied to schools as well. So you can see in the image what traditional leadership looks like with the leader at the top and everyone is kind of falling under that leader and doing uh, what's best for the leader, kind of reporting back up. Servant leadership flips that model and the customers are the primary focus. And then employees are there, the frontline employees are there to ensure customers have everything that they need. And leadership's responsibility is to ensure that the employees have everything that they need in order to best meet the needs of customers. So think about that in a school setting, who would be the customers? So in that instance, the final end user is the student. We wanna do everything to really maximize student outcomes. The front line are the teachers who are there to support the students with everything that they're doing. And then coaches, their role is to make sure that they are supporting the teachers and giving them all of the tools to be as successful as possible with the students and so on. So I want you to keep this framework in mind as we're thinking about parallel process with the class tool in your culture. So what is parallel process? Parallel process happens when you're interacting with teachers in the same way that you expect the teachers to interact with children. So you're parallel, you're going side by side, you're doing the same things. We know that by reflecting those interactions, that's how the teachers are learning those interactions as well. They're receiving information in the way that you want them to then be giving information to the teachers, or sorry, to the students. Gloria, next slide, please. So I want you all to reflect a little bit. Chat in for me. What role are you playing to create a culture of class within your program? So what are some of your strengths? What are some things that you're doing with your teachers, with your program as a whole that's creating that safe space that makes everybody feel as comfortable coming to work in giving their best and making mistakes. So I see positive feedback, positive interactions, reflective listening. We polled them to see what they need. So that's, that's a great example of understanding what your, uh, what your peers, what your educators, what your staff, what they need. And then uh, one time when I gave this presentation, I mentioned the golden rule and someone called out to me, Kiana, have you heard of the platinum rule? So uh, it, it really like resonated with me. So the golden rule we all know is that you're treating others as you want to be treated. The platinum rule on the other hand is treating others as they want to be treated. So it's oh, I think I have heard of that. I haven't so, heard it called the platinum rule, but that's a good one. Yeah, it really stuck with me because it's not just how I want to be treated, because how I want to be treated might might not be what someone else needs. I might have tougher skin and I might or I might be more sensitive and making sure that you're really supporting what others need, not just what you would want. I would add in addition to Aaron, given 
our multiple intersecting identities, sometimes treating people how you are treated um, under, has some underlines of um, privilege there that we need to recognize. So when we come at things from a DEI lens, um, I really like you elevating the platinum rule. I think it's more equitable. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, Gloria, I think we've got some really great responses in the chat here. We can go to the next slide. So uh, Teachstone's approach to coaching, practice-based coaching. I think we're all fairly familiar with that, that you're, you're, you've got that ongoing cycle. So it's the foundation of our coaching, uh, provides the support for using class parallel process, working with varying levels of teacher readiness. We wanna engage resistant teachers use data to, uh, to guide observations and more. And so one thing that also stood out for me in the past was um, that some teachers are a little bit resistant to coaching sometimes. And thinking about the fact that even Olympic athletes have coaches. Doesn't matter if you're at the top of your game. One of my favorite quotes, if you've seen me present before, is the moment you think you have nothing left to work on, you need to work on your humility we always have things that we can be doing to be working and growing and just setting that example with coaching that we're just trying to bring our best selves to work. We're trying to do this for the kids to maximize those outcomes. Okay, next slide. All right, so parallel process and applying that, uh, applying class to adult interactions. So we've got teacher student here. We've got coach teacher. And then Gloria, yep, so teacher student, what are they doing? They are building relationships with students by engaging in social conversations. Coach and teacher, coach is building the relationship with the teachers by engaging in social conversations. So the exact same thing, the impact is higher motivation to learn, higher level of comfort and more connectedness. So the same impacts, the same outcomes that we want to see from our students, we wanna see those from our educators as well, that comfort level, connection to what they're doing, especially with how high burnout levels can be right now and the challenges that teachers are facing day in and day out. We want them to feel connected. We want them to feel comfortable. We want them to feel safe. So some examples of this, of what this coaching relationship might look like using the class tool. So emotional support. Coach is gonna build trust through active listening. I saw some folks say active listening uh, in the chat here as well. Active listening, demonstrating empathy and cultural responsiveness. So Kiana, I know you're gonna talk about cultural responsiveness a little bit more uh, later in this webinar, but I think that's so important. And I remember um, some times in my past where I've been asked to cover my tattoos, for example, or you know, not, not bring my whole true self. And I think that um, it kind of ties your hands behind your back a little bit when you can't be your, your genuine self and you're, you have these other thoughts that are coming into play and, oh no, do I need to cover my arms? Are my arms showing right now? Um, I think that's super important. Yeah, I just answered a question that I didn't, even, I didn't think about like holding it to the end, but it speaks to just what you're saying, Erin, where somebody asked, it was actually Crystal, um, who said, how should I deal with teachers listening to me to appease me by not doing any of the things that make their classroom better? We have a new curriculum and they are not trying to learn or implement it in their classrooms. Part of what you're speaking about is allowing folks to bring their full authentic selves. What I offer to Crystal is, have you created a space where vulnerability is possible and people have the ability to fail forward? So some of what you're naming is, um, just creating a space of resistance and tension. And so when folks can't feel that they can be vulnerable, share their authentic selves, I'm, I'm definitely not going to share with you when I'm struggling. And so I do think that there's something to the relationship building um, part that I just wanted to name here because it fit right in with what you were sharing. So thanks for elevating that. Thank you. And I want to call out as well a comment in the chat here um, that I was going to be getting to. So we need to consider the trauma that providers and teachers are experiencing. Maslow theory applies to staff. If they are struggling, then it's harder for them to be empathetic towards children. And that is so true. If you've ever heard the phrase, you have to Maslow before you can bloom, you have to have the foundational supports there. And that's one of the things, you know, we're thinking about what are, what are kids bringing into the classroom? What are they dealing with at home that they're bringing into the classroom? 
But not only are our educators bringing in, you know, things from outside the classroom, but they're also experiencing vicarious trauma through the experiences of their students. And so how are you supporting your teachers and your educators and helping them have that resilience and putting, you have to put your oxygen mask on, right? You have to put your oxygen mask on before you can be there for others. And so how are you supporting your teachers so that they can bring their best self to your students? I think that's a great point, Rebecca. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so you can see all these different examples of how you can really support with emotional support during your coaching. So responding to the emotional, intellectual, and practical needs with individualized support. So what is it that you need right now that you're not able to effectively do with your kids? Do you need more materials? Do you need an additional space for kids to go to to calm themselves? Do you need to be able to step out of the classroom in a certain situation? Coach allows choice and provides chances for increased responsibility to support autonomy. So coach isn't just giving the information, but rather uh, is giving that, um, putting some of that onus on the educator to take that responsibility as well. Coach encourages collaboration in order to meet the educator's set goals. Okay, next slide, Gloria, is classroom organization, which you don't want your teacher running in at the last second, completely flustered, doesn't have their materials ready. That sets the tone for the school day, and then the students aren't going to be as prepared. Similarly, with coaching, you want to make sure that you're maximizing that time by having clear plans that maintain the focus on the goals, that you're prepared and you're structuring that discussion around those goals. Using a variety of modalities and strategies and materials. And so just like we know that students can get bored with the same type of modality and students have different learning styles, so do educators. Ask them questions, give them scenarios, have them do some critical thinking, thinking through, well, how, how could I have done this differently? And then gives you an idea of where they're at for you to be able to then make those tweaks and see how you can best support. Anything you wanna add there, Kiana? All right, uh, instructional support. Um, again, so coach eliciting and linking new concepts to the educator's prior knowledge. So scaffolding that information relating it back to what we already know, and then advancing that understanding. Encouraging metacognition through reflection, through explanation, self-evaluation. I think self-evaluation is so important as well to be able to reflect on what you're doing yourself. Feedback loops with the educator by asking follow-up questions, leading to that deeper understanding. So again, encouraging that critical thinking, that autonomy, Okay, next slide. So when we put all of this together, parallel process is supporting that collaborative relationship because you're being dependable, you're showing that you're credible, you're creating intimacy in that relationship, you're creating a safe space, and all of that is leading to trust within that coaching relationship. And then ultimately, you know, I'm talking specifically coach teacher relationship right now, but this is in all of your interactions, all of your adult adult interactions throughout the program, you want to really be building that collaborative supportive relationship. Um, so when I first did this presentation, this was a post that I saw that just really resonated with me. Um, so I'm going to read it to you and I'm going to read it pretty quickly because of just the, the impact that it had. How are you doing? I'm fine. And then terrible. And then crying. And then laughing. And then screaming. And then grateful. And then I'm over it. And then I'm determined. And then terrified. And then anxious. And then happy. And then exhausted. All in the same minute. And so that's to really just center that idea that we have so much going on during this pandemic, the past few years, the way everything has been. And those emotions change so often. What folks are going through, whether it's with their family, with their friends, just the world as a whole, 
and being mindful of that and asking, how are you doing? Just centering on that. How are you doing? How can I help you? And sometimes maybe doing that coaching isn't the right moment for an actual coaching moment. Maybe you need to just sit and talk and thinking about that. Thanks, Erin. That is so great, everything that you shared. So now that Erin's talked a little bit about some of the work that you can do yourselves, we're going to start to focus on the environment that you're trying to create for all folks to thrive. So I would love for you all to do is just think and let's brainstorm together. What would it take or what are some of the aspects of culture that makes staff feel welcome and happy? I'd love to see some of your ideas in the chat. Daily check-ins with teachers to ask how... We can support them for that day, respect, um, a positive attitude. Okay, positive attitudes. I have a challenge with some of the, that language. Sometimes those kind of, um, those words have a subscription to white dominant norms that we need to be careful of. Similar to respect, respect looks different to different cultures. Identifying needs, being recognized by parents, modeling vulnerability. I love Brene Brown's work. Under being understanding and supportive, um, helping hands, being good listeners, communication, being respectful of ideas and cultures, okay? Being responsive versus reactive. Everyone loves somebody with a plan that is really helpful. Showing up for support without expectation, support when needed, inclusion in the process. Yes, 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 I'm gonna talk a lot about that. Respect and listening, listening and talking with staff and not to them, not at them, yes. Similar to the work that we do in communities, you should do it alongside them and not have things happen to them. True concern for their well-being and flexibility. Be open to every culture and needs, leading by example. You all have so many great ideas um, from acknowledging, acknowledging their work to being positive, to being inclusive, um, to actually listening and understanding the check-ins, all of these things will contribute to a positive culture and a, a space where everyone can thrive. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the ongoing work that you can do um, that will help to actualize this. That's going to get a little bit deeper and require a little bit more. So at my organization called Profound Ladies, part of what we do is we do cultivate um, spaces for educators to thrive because we do center their well being and we are centered in creating trauma informed spaces for educators. What that means is that we are asking our teachers what they need. I saw that in the chat. Instead of making assumptions about what folks actually need, because we have all, all have different identities and we navigate this world um, in a unique way, then it's very important for us to recognize that folks have different needs depending upon different times. Our organization was founded right at the the murder of George Floyd. Part of what was happening during that time is um, folks were going back into the classroom and expected to teach online. Um, you could have stayed on that slide, Gloria, as though nothing was happening. And so part of what um, we recognize is that there's a, we need a space where people can talk about how they are not okay, how just turning teaching into online we're watching, while we're watching Black people being murdered in the streets is it's not part of our norm. Um, and navigating that takes a different set of um, skill sets, but also intentionality that didn't exist for people of color. And so really thinking about what do individuals need um, giving, given their unique set of identities. During the COVID pandemic, a lot of our Asian teachers were really struggling being the target of ongoing and increased violence. And so again, just recognizing everybody's own um, um, identities and how that plays into how they navigate the world while you're trying to create some of these trauma-informed spaces. You're always going to fail, right? We're always going to have a way that we're leaving folks off because we have our own bias. Um, but part of what we leverage in, at Profound Ladies is the work of Elena Aguilar. I'm going to drop the link um, to this book here in the chat. Um, the work that she has created is called um, Cultivating Emotional Resilience in Educators. The thing that I love about this particular curriculum, you're welcome, Angelica, is that it kind of outlines what is happening for educators along the school year. So she's studied teachers. She's been in coaching for over 20 years. And so, yes, Rebecca, the view of migrants. Um, there's so many communities, like I said, that you would leave off. And so part of what you can do with Onward is just really think about the ebbs and flows of teaching and being an educator and what um, teachers need during those particular times, as well as then curate a space um, based upon this for your own individual needs. Part of what you can also do as leaders, because mo most of you here are leaders, is eliminate some of the busy work. 
I've heard from so many teachers that things that could have been an email are now meetings. There's an increase in expectations without an increase in compensation. And that in itself um, alludes to inequity for educators, um, especially for those of you who sit in seats of power. Think about how you are leveraging that power and how you are either holding power over or power um, power within a community. Someone mentioned that in the chat, being inclusive of your teachers' voices would be one of the things that could be um, important for creating um, things that you can control to help create spaces where folks are, are um, allowed to thrive. Uh, the last thing that I will mention on this slide is um, just thinking about some of the things that you may have into place. Um, that are creating inequities that you may not have thought about before. I do think in the middle of all of the social unrest, folks consciousness was um, awakened. And so now we're, we're realizing where we may have things in place that are highly problematic, um, but more than that, marginalize a group of people. And so go back to your dress codes, go back to your, um, your standard code of ethics or, or handbooks and think about all of the different impact that it may have and invite your staff into that process because I, I guarantee you and if, if, if you're not thinking about it then dig deeper right like there's something that you can revisit in that space within your locus of control that could definitely cultivate a, a, a better space um, for teachers well-being. So I've said a lot and I want to read some of the things that are in the chat just to see what you all are thinking about some of the um, ideas that I've shared that you all can change tomorrow. Like you can do these things right away. So to support teachers, we can reduce busy work. We've created many creative curriculum study tubs that are filled with study materials and books. They're appreciating the support. Good. And then make them a part of the process. That's right, Wendy. We should not be doing things to people. People should have agency and voice and they should be able to advocate on their behalf. And that includes you as leaders to inviting educators into that space. And so really, I know Aaron talked a lot about this servant leadership, but being servant leaders means that you're doing things with communities and not to them. And that includes your communities of teachers. Alex says that advocating for and with them from systemic, systemic level changes and support supports an education policy, organizes a community with a shared identity in education, as opposed to teachers versus admin and leadership. Yes, and that divide has been around um, since the creation of the education system. And I think that being intentional about dismantling some of the power dynamics ex that exist there would, is absolutely in your locus of control and would create a space where educators feel um, both valued and appreciated. Yes, Alex, you can sit right on this panel with me and Erin. Thank you. I love that you all are um, filing in with so many ideas. Please keep them coming. I'm gonna continue to build off the energy that is in the chat. Um, what I would like to do is go on to one more slide because what Alex shared is a perfect segue to how do we create um, some of the conditions um, that exist at the systemic level. And so what I'm gonna share with you is a video, um, just a really quick video my, about microaggressions um, because Erin mentioned earlier, they're similar to students. Um, imagine a, a child on their way to school, they may encounter four or five people. The same thing is happening with your educators. And if they are people of color or hold a marginalized identity, then they probably have navigated some very toxic exchanges and interactions on the way that may contribute to how they are showing up. And so what we're going to do is just um, watch a quick two minute video. Um, and then we're going to reflect on what microaggressions look like. I do want to name that there is some strong language in the video that I think we all can handle, but I didn't want to offer up um, that warning before we preview this. And then we're going to come back and talk a little bit about exactly what Alex named some of the systemic changes that we all be a part of as we work to create a culture where everybody is appreciated and valued. All right. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh. Just imagine instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. 
Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping so advice. I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can I touch it? Can I please? Is fucking annoying. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes, which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try less challenging, Major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. All right, thank you for sharing that in to the chat. Um, and some of you may have seen that video before. I said someone said that they really liked that video. To me, it's the most um, for like simple way to explain um, all of the different ways that um, microaggressions impact people. And so recognize that your teachers are experiencing microaggressions too. So while you're working to create um, trauma-informed spaces and recognize that they're carrying vicarious trauma from the interactions that they're having with students, also recognize that a part of their identity means that there are other things that are at play when they show up every day. So what does that mean for you all? That means that you have some work to do. Um, you need to engage in some ongoing DEI work. Um, even from the microaggression video, you can see that there are so many identities that I do not hold, that you do not hold, that Aaron does, does not hold, that will prevent us from seeing things from an equitable lens. Um, but we can work really hard to be in allyship and co conspirators with other groups that we do not belong, and we still will always miss the mark. And that just means that that person experiences another mosquito bite. And like the video said, that is very annoying. And more than that, it's an act of violence. And so asking our, our teachers to show up every day when they've been, um, when they've experienced violent violence, whether it's emotional, physical, or um, verbal abuse is hard. And so part of what your work should be is to create an inclusive work environment by making sure that you are, are going on your own identity journey as a leader. If you're not comfortable facilitating that learning on your own, you should find organizations that are comfortable facilitating that learning. My, does DEI include ageism? Yes. It includes ageism and there is some privilege in that. Um, some folks do mention that. Um, oftentimes I've heard that question come from white women who would like to insert themselves because they have felt left out. So that was my like rolling eyes. It's like, oh, here we go. Um, someone mentioned that one time when I was talking about 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education and equity for all students. And then I said, well, what about um, white women who are over 50? And my answer was, what about? Anyway, so I do want to encourage us to continue to think about how we're creating a more inclusive work environment. Um, and that does mean engaging in some deep, 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 deep work. So if you don't have an organization that is near you, find an organization that can meet your DEI needs by you first assessing where your DEI needs are. I did find um, during our organization does lead that kind of learning. And I did find that during the height of the social unrest, which was right around 2020, um, when the murder of George Floyd happened, folks dived in two feet. So all of a sudden, all organizations wanted to be anti-racist. And that might not be where your organization is. And that kind of learning should be scaffolded in a way that you don't create additional microaggressions and that you don't put the burden of that learning on folks who hold marginalized identities including um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. So while you are leading these spaces, please be intentional about the way that you scaffold that learning and work really hard um, in community with the people that you lead alongside the community, communities that you serve to create a plan that will outline um, how you can best um, support a, an environment that is both, that is diverse, equitable, and more inclusive. I'm going to take a look here in the chat, but Aaron, I wanted to see if you had any thoughts um, from some of the things that I've shared around what leaders can do in their own control um, for creating environments where folks can thrive. And I think this, this plays really well with everything I had said earlier on of just, and, and somebody 
it's come up a couple of times in chat about asking the teachers what it is that they need. Establishing that trust so that you can engage in these conversations and, and get that feedback. I know we do that a lot here at TeachStone. We're getting feedback from our from our peers, from the staff to say, okay, where are we really excelling and where do we need to improve culture? And I think that goes back to the whole always be learning, always be improving. That's not just on an individual basis. That's also on a programmatic business basis and, and always be striving to be improving the culture, to have as equitable culture as possible, to be learning what others need and how you can support and be showing up as allies every day, uh, regardless of who needs your support, there to support those in need. Thank you. I see in the chat that there is a lot of um, banter, some of it around some of the legislation that is created to um, kind of stifle these kind of conversations. Um, what I will say unapologetically is that um, history is history. And so you can try to rewrite it, but the history is what the history is. And so that we should just teach it. So I know that there are some legislation to do not want teachers to talk about 1619, which was the first introduction of um, Black folks to this country um, in, in enslavement. And um, a lot of folks don't want um, teachers to talk about race. Um, they think that it has no place in education. What I will say is 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education and the exclusion of Black, Indigenous, people of color out of the education system brought race into the equation. And so I do not think that you can solve race problems with race neutral solutions. Um, and currently we do have challenges in our education system that are um, cut across um, that particular line. And so I do think um, there are ways that um, you have to just stand up for what is right. Um, two years ago, I was working with a friend. He, he was leading a school and they had um, the racist mascot um, that is often seen for some teams. And um, I'm a black person and um, I challenged the use of that particular mascot in the school and was told that like, well, you're not native, so why do you care? Um, and, and it was at a time when folks weren't really having that conversation. I will say to you all as leaders, that is not easy um, taking on diverse the equity and inclusion work is not something that is sexy. It's going to put a target on your back. People have politicized um, folks' identity. Someone said, well, I don't want to be made to feel bad for my race. Me neither. <laughs> I did not. My folks did not want to be enslaved because they were a particular race. Um, we don't want certain outcomes because of a particular race. Families at borders don't want to be broken up because they are a particular race. And so I do think that the conversation just has to acknowledge what is the truth and not create alternative facts as to uh, appease um, certain political um, agendas. When it comes down to kids, for me, it's just about kids, less about red or blue. And so um, I will leave you all with that as leaders um, to decide in which way you will decide to be uh, a servant leader. And some of that means that you will decide um, to play it safe. And that has its own risks and rewards. And sometimes you go out on a limb and that has its own, its own risks and rewards. And so I won't tell you what to do. I can only speak from my experience. I also see um, someone ask the ageism on the opposite end exists, like people who present younger than the age in any race but are un undermined because of their age when people might not even be aware of the age or ability. This could be a privileged perspective and I apologize for that, but I'm interested in hearing your opinion. Yeah, well, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, Stephania. So um, I don't have an opinion on it just yet. Um, teachers need trauma-informed training for their use in the classrooms and working with for children and families. Yes, we keep asking teachers to leave trauma-informed spaces while inducing trauma on them. And so they just work out their trauma on kids. So I absolutely agree with that, Carla. Um, yes, everyone speak up, listen to Rebecca. Um, at Carla, we have trauma-informed training for that reason. Some of what I described today comes from research and training and some of that stays in the pedagogy space and in that heady space and it doesn't actualize to practice. And so what I would challenge you all to do um, is to put it into practice and actually make your words walk. Um, never fear the truth. Thank you, Rebecca. It's just and calling everyone into action. I appreciate that. I'm glad to say that we offer trauma-informed care for our staff. We also have behavior specialists to help staff with any suggestions to try in the classroom. And um, we need resources for trauma-informed training. And um, the first part of the webinar, I did drop um, some of the 
trauma informed, right? Like it's not a complete trauma space because I'm not a trauma expert, but there are some ways to think about how ACEs plays out with kids and then what ACEs looks like amongst adults. And also some of the work that I put um, in the chat from Elena Aguilar does address trauma in, in the form of creating a space um, where educators are cultivating resilience. Um, and then um, Aaron just dropped some trauma informed professional development that can be found there, including some of the heart of healing um, web webinars. Leave that space and time for staff to share their emotions and needs. Thank you, Nedra. One of the modules, yes. And then Aaron dropped that. You all have some great ideas and I know that you have a, a huge gigantic role. I won't undermine that your job is hard and um, anything worth doing is, is hard work. And so you all are creating a better world for our children to inherit. And so, yep, yeah, it does require a little bit of um, grittiness and um, yeah, it's, it's really hard and challenging. So thank you all for doing it. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Aaron. For people who still. Thank you, Kiana. Um, so I did want to say, so in the chat, Kiana mentioned that we put in the trauma-informed uh, professional development that we have, as well as uh, we have a banking time professional development, which is more about relationship equity and making sure that the students that need the most attention are really being focused on and you're creating those intentional interactions to really earn their trust and develop those relationships. So we have that as well. Uh, we have a couple questions in the Q&A here, um, but actually, so we have action items first. We wanna do the action items and then we can go to the Q&A. Sure, some of what I put on what leaders can do now is to really think about racial identity development training. I know that like someone said in the state of Florida, you're not allowed to talk about race um, and click on that first link there or I'll, I'll drop it in the chat to just understand what we mean when we say racial identity um, development as well as some unconscious bias work which will help you to get to some of the essentials around what needs to be true in your, in, um, in your, in your particular environments. We also talked about like less is more. So really eliminating this busy work and taking away things from teachers so that they have the ability to breathe and they have the table space to make some of this stuff happen, right? Um, next year, what you can do, and I saw it in the chat, someone said, let's be more responsive instead of reactive. So pre proactively create a wellness plan and schedule it out. What is happening in August for your teachers in September and in um, November? That book that is there from Elena Aguilar really spells it out, and then you all could actually add to it in a way that probably will help to build some capacity if you are struggling with, you know, like, how do I make this happen with the time frame that I'm given? Um, there are ways that you can build community um, that is inclusive of all folks. Some of it is just like on the identity development work that you need to do, but also in centering teacher voices and the folks that you're serving. So I don't know if that means creating like a, um, a subcommittee or an advocacy, advocacy group where folks can actually share from their experience what is happening, um, conducting empathy interviews, um, creating a culture awareness group, like folks um, would love to think about what they can contribute to their workspace that would make it more fun to come to work because in a capitalist society, we have to go to work in order to make a living. And so it would be great to do that in a, in a space where you're not continuously traumatized and or experiencing tension. The last thing that I will go back to over and over again is some of what Aaron shared around the deconstruction of power dynamics and the servant leadership. And so again, really thinking about what kind of leader you are. We know what educators say about their administrators. We know the divide that happens between the admin and the teachers. And are you further perpetuating that power dynamic? Are you yielding power in a way that serves your own ego or in a way that serves kids? And so really challenging yourself to take you out of the middle and recognize that this work is so much bigger than who you are. Okay, so questions. We do have a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, I know at least one of them, Kiana, is going to be for you and not me. <laughs> so I'll start with this first one here. Uh, I often see coaches providing the sandwich method of feedback. I'm not sure that works. What do you think? Uh, so I can tell you from my experience um, working with, we did in a previous role, I did a lot of coaching training, management leadership training, and the sandwich method is discouraged. Um, the sandwich method, for those that don't know, is where you give a good piece of feedback, 
something to work on and then a good piece of feedback again. And oftentimes the, or, or vice versa, something to work on, something good, something to work on. And ultimately the messaging can get a little bit muddied like that. Um, and either the piece to work on is lost with those really great, the really great feedback or vice versa, the good feedback, the positive feedback is lost in between the things to work on. Um, so personally, like I would recommend doing all the good things and then here's some things to work on or vice versa, or just kind of not sandwiching it, just doing it organically and just having that conversation sequentially through an interaction. Here's how things were. Here's what we can improve upon. Yeah, the thing that I would add to that is too, is think about the intention behind sharing feedback. A lot of what you're sharing feedback is a gift. I always say that to folks and that you're trying to help someone to grow. And so a lot of the reason why you share positive feedback is so that whatever folks are doing that is like working, you want them to do more of that. And then offering the things that can be potential, potential growth areas is just an opportunity for them to continue to personally and professionally reach the goals that they both have set individually for themselves, but also for the kids that they serve. Yes, and you, you are, yes, right, Anna, you're building on strengths. You're welcome, Lanita. Yes, Alex, it ties back to how to treat people, ask how they wanna be treated. You, you actually can do that too, Erin. I think that's a great advice from Alex is like, how would you like to receive feedback? Um, and just know that for some folks, they are used to being criticized and sometimes it is hard to be celebrated because they don't recognize um, or have had challenges being celebrated and recognized at work. And so some of that is just, I tell that a lot to um, teachers and our coaches, you know, like if you give um, a child a compliment or you say, I want to call home, they automatically think that it's about something negative. And that's because it has held that connotation for so long. So recreating a, a, a culture where a good phone call home um, happens, it, it takes time. And so similar to feedback, um, you may have folks who are resistant to receiving positive feedback and it just takes time um, to really help them to orient and not be deficit based. I just actually messaged a coworker the other day and I was like, hey, can I give you some feedback? And they said yes, but they were waiting for me to say like, you messed up. And I was like, that thing you did, that was awesome. Like, I really like that you did this. And they were like, wait a second, wait, where's the catch? Yeah. Because of exactly what you're saying, we don't mm -hmm. give enough. I think just we being general, People. we in life. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> yeah. we don't give enough of the positive reinforcement yeah. in that strengths-based approach. Here are those great things you're doing. Here's why they're great. Keep yes. those up. Yeah. And Jennifer um, Net recognized that in the chat too. She says she wants them to see the positive things they're doing because they sometimes do not recognize it. And that is so true. Some folks just don't even see that some, some people are just really naturally great at things. And so you got to call it out, which is why I also like to tell um, leaders and you all could practice doing this too. make it less about yourselves. This is, this is one of the relationship building that Lori um, is mentioning. Whenever I'm coaching my coaches, I always tell them, don't use, I love language. I like similar to what I tell my teachers. Don't say to the little kid, I like the way that you're saying the line. I love who anybody cares what you like or love. Right. But just naming what is important. It's important that you're, you're, you're interacting with kids like that because it leads to X, Y, or Z and then name the outcome. So when you're centering it on like what is actually happening and more than centering on yourself, that also also helps you to orient as a, a servant leader. So and Dawn says she try not to tell people what they did wrong. If we give positive, often the things we worked on are better received. Okay, Dawn, po po provide teachers with positive descriptive acknowledgement. That's right, Carla, positive descriptive acknowledgement. Like I, I could not stand getting the um, you know, just some of the fluff, right? Like get down to the, even the essentials, like what is it? Because I was so um, just set on being a really great educator. And so I, I wanted to know specifically what were the things that I did. Um, well, and then, you know, exactly specifically what to do again, not right. just like, oh yeah, that, that was good. You did a good job, but what was it that was good so that you can replicate that in the future and be more intentional in the future? Mm -hmm. Alex has another good, um, you know, how we mentioned like, folks' identities and coming in and missing that. So one of the things um, that we should recognize is that some folks are uncomfortable because of either trauma or neurodivergency. And some people may only want praise, but on the end. And so again, um, asking folks how they would like to receive feedback is an inclusive thing to do for all of the reasons that you all are named. You all are dynamic leaders already. I can tell because of the intentionality and in your questions and um, the things that you are offering up. And so I'm excited to see what the, how this lands with your communities.
We have more questions, Erin. Uh, so one of them is definitely for you. I don't know this book. Uh, do you rec uh, recommend her book, Coaching for Equity? Yes, I do. I, um, so they're talking about Elena Aguilar seri series. Um, she does have a book, Coaching for Equity. And I think that if you're, I use it for um, training my coaches. Um, she also has the um, coaching teams uh, like that one and the art of coaching as well. She's done a lot of research and a lot of work on what it means to approach coaching from an anti-racist lens. So I, I really do love um, and appreciate her work. Um, and I'm not getting paid to say that. <laughs> I get no kickbacks for it. I was going to say, I think, so the other two questions that are left here, one of them looks to be a response to the other question. Sure. And I'm thinking that one, I don't know if you want to try and tackle this with me right now. Question, or, or if we should, yeah. I'm thinking, well, because I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm just going to say I don't might, know. Uh, see, I can, I can work through it, but I'm thinking it might be better for a private conversation. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to kind of, touch on it a little bit leave it private if you think okay. I, I trust your judgment yeah yeah, yeah. all right um, any other questions y'all all right so glory if we can go to the last slide here uh so one thing that we do want to mention so um we've been talking about building confidence building trust building rapport within your culture and how can we do that across diverse settings? So many of you know that we are uh, rolling out second edition of Pre-K, K-3, July 1st. Part of that is that we have some additional observer supports that we've been working on. A lot of what we're doing with moving to second edition is really honing in on that equity lens and, and really moving from the um, the experience of the average child in the classroom to the experience of every child in the classroom and how do we meet the needs of all kids. And so thinking about that, we've got these class observation supports as well uh, that we're rolling out. So the settings with dual language learners are available currently. So supporting uh, in classrooms, basically what we're looking at is professional development to hone specific observation skills, uh, meeting some of those potential critiques that have taken place in the past about how does this domain or dimension look in this particular cultural setting or with a special education classroom and things of that nature. So we have one for dual language learners and then coming later this fall, we're going to have one for reducing bias and we'll also have one for settings serving children with disabilities. Uh, so if you do have questions about those, definitely reach out to um, your Teach Stone rep, your class consultant, whether that's myself or someone else. Uh, if you don't have a direct contact, reach out to learn more at teachstone.com. Uh, oh, and then there was a one last question. Mm -hmm. and. I'm gonna leave that one for you, Kiana. What are some okay. strategies for getting leadership on board who may not be supportive of DEI informed workplace? I, I love data. I think it's always data. And so one of the things that um, I, I live in North Carolina and um, I often serve a lot of rural regions and I don't mention that um, to call them out specifically, but some of the challenges that I do have are in some of the rural regions. And what I have found to be helpful is just centering on data. Um, students, oftentimes where they're main, where there's always a need to have a DNI informed approach. And um, it is usually, um, I can show where there, there are a variety of experiences and it's cut across either race or class. And so looking at students' data around like um, achievement, but also like how they're experiencing relationships in the building would be helpful. I don't know if you all do some um, surveys for your, your teachers and your families and just centering on numbers. Oftentimes when you can make it not a personal thing and just centering what is actually happening, then you can approach, okay, we have this challenge where these particular um, folks feel marginalized in this particular way. And so now you have a problem that may be cut across um, a specific demographic that you can then use a DE&I plan um, to help address that. So I hope that that um, helps. 
Um, you could also think about some of, if, you, if your school doesn't offer up data, there's a way to find some of this data at the federal level, especially around expulsions and suspensions. So when you think about some of the push out practices that happen that are cut across race, that is another way that you can show where unconscious bias, it's just a, it's just a fact, plays a, a, a role into pushing students out of the classroom. So earlier, someone mentioned respect um, in the chat and on a lot of like some of the push out practices or some of the ways that um, students are written up um, a lot of them I think it was almost 80 percent of referrals are um, subjective because they mentioned things like not showing respect or you know language that doesn't really pinpoint down to um, what is essentially happening in, in the classroom and so um, I hope that that just offers up a, a quick answer but also y'all you can follow me on LinkedIn and, and reach out to me on IG so we can continue this conversation because we won't cover it all and solve all of these problems in a in a, in a um in an hour, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Were you, oh, I'm sorry. Erin, were you done with this, this slide? You did, okay, perfect. All right. Uh, thank you, Erin and Kiana and all of our audience today for what has been a, a really robust discussion. Um, I'm excited for you all to get uh, that recording and a copy of the slide deck uh, so that you can sort of re-digest this conversation again and share in your circles. Um, that will be coming to your emails in the next 24 hours. Um, but thank you again, everyone, Aaron and Kiana, for your time and for your expertise. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and we'll see you all next time. Bye. Thank you all. Have a good one.